Hey there, Neil. Hey. How's it going? Good. How you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Good. Good. Not too bad. Neil Santos, if you could just introduce yourself to the Our Mind on Music viewers. Yeah, uh, my name is Neil Santos, and I have been playing guitar for a very long time. Went to Berkeley. I uh, got a degree in film scoring and um, got out and started teaching guitar and wanted to take a look at or reimagine, if I could, the way that guitar is taught, you know, um, right from the beginning. I didn't want to just throw Mel Bay books in front of people or Jamie Habersaw books and be like, all right, here you go. And then just kind of check out, you know, and be like, all right, do page one, you know, page one and then let me know how it goes and come back next week. You know, I. I figured there's probably a better way. Um, so I've always tried to just simplify it, uh, the, the process of learning. Um, and I've done that with a couple books, uh, The Guitar Simplified um, and The Lefty Guitar Survival Handbook. Yep. Different ways to kind of visualize the guitar and uh, just short descriptions that just get right to the point and stuff like that. And then I wanted to do that online and, and try to find a way to teach improvising using kind of that 80 80 20 rule right what's the 20 percent of stuff that you can learn that's going to give you the 80 percent uh returns you know like um and that's how i i kind of landed on the pentatonic scale because i grew up you know in hair bands and all that and you know also classic rock zz top i feel like billy gibbons really kind of like you know, he is the the architecture of rock solos, everything he plays. And then you have all the, the the fancy fast stuff that goes on top of it. But everything slow that people play in between the fast stuff, I feel like goes back to him or, you know, the blues. But that's where the pentatonic's from. And, you know, you also have the major pentatonic and stuff. So I have uh, the pentatonicway.com and uh, I've been teaching over there and building courses. But I'm excited to say that I'm redoing all the courses and I'm really excited about it. You have all new videos, went into like a professional studio with like the three cameras and the audio wow. and the light. I'm pretty <laughs> excited about it. So that's going to be dropping pretty soon in the next month or so. Uh, wow, that's cool. Course. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. You hear fear first, right? So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, breaking news I'll, I'll put one of those little scrolling things with a ticker on the bottom <laughs> breaking <yeah>. news <laughs> brand new pentatonic weight course coming your way so yeah i'm excited about it I, I tried to take what i learned from from making the first course and i've been teaching in-person workshops now that like you say covid is 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 behind us hopefully or at least the major lockdowns Right. So I started once that started letting up, I started at in-person workshops at, at local music stores and library. You had and, one this um, morning, right? I, yeah. I, saw, yeah. I saw a link online, uh, the your public library. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just wanted cool. to like, get community together, you know, like also try these things out in the wild. I know it works for me. And I've heard feedback online from people all over the world. Oh, this is great. I, like makes so much sense now. And but I want—I never really got to teach it face to face, so it's just amazing to see people their eyes light up or like they just go, "Oh my gosh!" Like in the last fifteen minutes, I learned more than I did in like the last ten years of trying to figure stuff out. And it's—it's it's really just a simple concept. It's easy to understand, but then it takes a while of just doing it to kind of integrate it into your playing and like make it intuitive to see like on the neck. But that's all right. I mean, like. It gives you something to practice every time you pick up the guitar, even if it's a five minutes, I feel like I get better. If I just start jamming over a couple chords and yeah, I, I feel mean, like I got better. Yeah, I, I saw like we were just saying you did a you did a session um earlier today at uh, Rogers Memorial Library. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you research. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so but I was I I was imagining that like what you just said because a lot of what you've been doing with the pentatonic way, which we're going to talk about the PW improv jams in a moment. Yeah, that, that's a lot of fun. It's fantastic. I mean, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I just want okay. to that point in the library because I was thinking about that. Like for me as a teacher, as a music teacher, my yeah. greatest joy I think is that moment where I have a kid who has let's say a guitar in their hand. 
and they've been trying to play a D chord for like six classes or four classes, whatever. And suddenly it comes out and it rings out beautifully exactly the way they wanted. And you just see their eyes like light up, you know? Yeah. There's that yep. moment. And, you know, what you were describing just now reminded me of that, like where you have 10 years of trying to break past being a beginner. I can play chords now and I can start to sort of noodle on solos and the pentatonic way. Suddenly people just go, blah, wait a minute. That sounded good. I'm like, yeah, yeah. It sounds like I know what I'm doing all of a sudden. You know, that's always my goal with any well, sort of art or anything I do. It's always like, oh, that. That sounds are like that looks like someone that knows what they're doing would do that. Yeah. Not, not that I know what I'm doing, but I think I could fool somebody to thinking I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and in the process, you kind of end up knowing what you're doing. That's so funny because <laughs> I remember years ago I was teaching in Venezuela, and a student that I was teaching she asked me to play a song that that I had written. So I, I played something for her, you know, and she said why is it when you play a song that you've written, it sounds like like what you just said, like it sounds like somebody who knows what they're doing did that. But when I write it, it feels like <laughs> just a school kid throwing it together or something. I don't remember exactly how she worded it. It was a great compliment, actually. Right. Um, yeah. Basically, what I said to her was like, that's first of all, that's your perception, because what I what I heard sounded really fresh and new, you know, right. the other part is. If that's the way you feel, then keep doing it. Like just keep plugging away at it and using guidelines like the pentatonic way would give you. It's that, like it's that feeling like when you create something, it's kind of like that kid hitting that D chord or that G chord and feeling like, well, that's that's what it's supposed to sound like. And it feels yeah. like that, you know, like when you hit that moment where you do something, you go, that was me. That was cool. Okay. All yeah. right. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel the same way. I taught for 10 years too, just private lessons. And, and I think that is the draw of teaching, no matter what it is, is you're you're imparting this info to someone. And when you see that transformation or that that knowledge settle in and you're like, I saw it, you got it. <laughs> you know, and so that's I think so let's let's segue then to the PW. Pent uh, pentatonic way improv jams which you host on twitter twitter x yeah <laughs> <laughs> and right. first of all uh if you can explain what that is maybe you can just in introduce first what i'm talking yeah. about yeah yeah so how it kind of came about um some people that we were chatting with on twitter we were just on there meeting some people and um you know Mostly just talk, you know, showing guitar pictures and, and funny guitar memes. And then someone was like, yo, we should do a thing where, like, we put up a jam track. Uh, and then we just jam to it. Everybody records a video all week. And we were like, yeah, let's, I'll do that. I'll, I'll put it up there and then we can, you know, see what happens. So we started and we, we what are we going to call it? A hashtag PW Improv Jam. All right, cool. And it wasn't, we didn't really put a whole bunch of thought into it. It's just one of those awesome things that just kind of happens, you know? And then people started, you know, getting, jumping on it right away. Um, people from all over the world. It was, it was just awesome how it happened. And then it just took off and more people did it. And some people, you know, sometimes they can't do it one week and then they do it another week. And then a bunch of weeks go by, it's the same people. And then like, you go, oh, that, that guy's new or that, you know, they're new. And you're like, hey, that sounds good. And, and and I love that it's just so positive too. I love first that you see all these different takes, uh, different stylistic interpretations and jams over the same track. And that's kind of interesting to see, you know, everybody has their own sound truly on the guitar. Um, and you, you go, oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. But then also just everybody's so positive and just lifting each other up rather than knocking each other down. And I think, you know, I don't want to badmouth the guitar community, but a lot of times I feel like it's very competitive and it's very like secretive. Like, I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. That's my special trick. And it's, you know, as opposed to like the drum community that I see where drummers would just tell you, oh, you want to check this out? I'll show you exactly what I'm doing. And they'll play it. Slow it down. Play. Understand what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. And they'll be like, yeah, just do this and you do that. And they 
you know, and they're so supportive and I feel like that's the vibe and the, the culture we have around the, the PW improv jam, totally. uh, which I love. So, yeah, for, for me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I, I remember when you were initially just sort of like texting about, or sorry, posting about, you know, this idea. And I thought that sounds really cool. And yeah. that was it. I just thought that sounds cool. And then when I saw it actually happening, I, I don't remember what were the like first couple songs that you put on, but instead of like just backing tracks per se, you put on like songs like like Journey, uh, Don't Stop Believing, yeah. or something, you know, which yeah. was for me playing live has always been one of those songs where you have to do that fast part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that part actually is not that hard for me. I, I watched a video that shows how Neil Sean actually does that. Yeah. It's, out of it you have to go with the drummer hitting the crash and i yeah. i have missed that i don't know like 80 percent of the time <laughs> I, I hit it too soon 20 like, percent of the times you hit it <laughs> that's right so <laughs> be positive no but that was <laughs> when i first saw those videos coming out i was blown away at like how people would interpret the same backing track like you just said Sometimes, like, I sent in one to you one time, and you were kind of surprised that it was done on my acoustic. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. Days. Yeah, yeah. We were in lockdown, and the only guitar I had at home was was my classical acoustic guitar. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, but you tore it up over it. Thank you. It thank didn't you. matter. I, yeah. The Alban Brothers on an acoustic uh, nylon string. <laughs> <laughs> you would be proud. Well, you know, it was, it was w what I needed to do at the time growing yep. from those moments like i'll never forget the guy who had posted this amazing solo over one of the songs that you like the backing tracks that you posted and i commented wow i love this part at you know one minute and 20 seconds or whatever and so he yep. went and he re-recorded himself playing it in slower time just like we were talk talking about with the drummers yeah, yeah. and he showed, like specifically showed me that moment so that I could pick up how to do that little lick. So yep. that the next time you posted something, I used that, or I tried to use that little lick in the improv that I did over one of your backing tracks. Yeah. And this is the essence of what makes this improv thing so cool is like people are looking to say, listen, you're doing it. Awesome. Yep. Keep doing it. And then on top of that, a guy like that who's like, he just had this amazing little thing. And then he went on and he explained how he had learned it, where it came from and stuff. And I was just like, this is more efficient learning than so right. many hours of classes that I've done. It was right. awesome. You know? That's amazing. I do remember that. Do you? Okay. Yeah. That was For me, that was so cool. And I haven't done one of those for a while now because just like you were saying, like sometimes it's just other things happen. And you don't have time to say yeah. I have sometimes, like, I used to try to get them done right at the beginning of the week. Now it's like Saturday or Sunday, and I'm like, oh, gosh, I got to get this done. And and I don't really want to, like, look at everybody else's before I do mine, so I'm not, like, influenced <laughs> or whatever. So, and I, I'm, like, thinking ahead to, like, where I have the new course coming out. In that platform, there's, like, the option to have, like, a community. And I would like to do something similar if I, you know, keep it on Twitter, but then have like, take it to the next level where it's like you say, like if it's a closed group or something where you have the jams, but then you can also respond to videos with videos, or maybe it's like a once a week, like group meetup mm -hmm. with, with whoever that's in the group and say, Oh, I loved your, you know, you could tell them and talk to them. Like, I loved your, uh, you know, your jam, Mikey. It was cool. What was that thing you did at this time? And like, oh, yeah, that's right. Blah, blah, blah. Or whatever. Or if someone asked me about mine, I could say, oh, that's this. It's, it's super simple. You know what I mean? Like, where you can kind of interact even more. Take I wonder what I'm doing with the workshop, like a community, but maybe online, you know? Yeah, I mean... I think that's a cool idea to begin with. Like I like I've said very clearly, I think this PW Improv Jam is on Twitter a super cool thing. Like I had been on Twitter before, just like my own personal yeah. account thing, and I was like, I left because it seemed like everything everybody said, people were just waiting for how to criticize that and and take it in different yeah. 
executive direction. Mm-hmm. A year ago, almost to the day, actually, the, we started Our Mind on Music, which anniversary. Nice. Congratulations. That's yeah. great. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I decided, you know what, we got to go on social media so people know it's there. I signed up for for Twitter again. And one of the things that I found was the Pentatonic Way, which I've used that sort of as the format for how I approach Twitter, which is try to be positive. Not, not like, I don't mean in any way sort of false. One of the things that's great about it is positivity, but it's not like fake. Like, it's not like people are just going, yeah, good job, buddy. <laughs> like very real feedback. Right. So, and little by little, I've been able to find and be part of a really cool, positive music specific community. And I think the yeah. sort of where that started for me anyway. Oh, good. It's, yeah. It's all about lifting each other up, you know, sincerely. That's the best part you know. of it, because it's not like people are just going, like I said, like not slap on the back all the time. It's like very specific, like some of the po- many of the posts people will say, I love this thing that happened at, you know, the the thirty second to thirty five second mark. You know, it's it's yeah. like uh, because it's guitarists looking at guitarists, thinking in terms of like what what do I want to take away from this kind of thing. Right. The other day, I was speaking with a guy who I came in contact with through LinkedIn. Actually, his name oh, okay. is Jerry B. This is not guitar specific, but I think it could be applicable to what you were just talking yeah. about. Jerry B, he has a podcast called The Entree Musician, as an entrepreneur musician. Okay, yeah, yeah. He also has a television show, much like yourself, like a, a, a program that he shows on TV as well as on the internet. One of the things that he has, he has this program called Artist Impact, and he has panelists. I think he has every time three or four panelists, like professionals in the music business. And he has people send in videos of them performing, doing whatever they do, singing, playing, whatever. And then these panelists give very specific feedback. He said it's kind of like America's Got Talent, but without the competition aspect to it. Okay. And I'm wondering if maybe the aspect of your course that you were talking about, maybe that's a possibility for the next level of what that could look like. Because yeah. someone like myself, I can write in like I do on the, the Twitter chats. But then if you yeah. had a couple of panelists who are like, you know, I'm thinking as as I say this, you were talking about Billy Gibbons. Um, Orianthe has played yeah. Billy Gibbons many times, and she she has reacted to some of the some of the stuff on the, the Pentatonic way, like on Twitter. Yeah, and yeah. Someone like her caliber, just to have the chance of someone of her caliber. Right. That reminds me a lot of like the, the business model that Artist Work has with like Paul Gilbert. Yes. Plays there and different people. You can send in like your video and you know they'll be like oh hey dude you gotta do this <laughs> you yeah. know like and how cool would it be to have paul gilbert like critique yeah. your work he seems like such, he's one of the he's a uh, positive role model for guitar you know what i mean he's always just super positive and but yeah no that would be amazing i guess i just want to try to get their attention first and then try to say hey would you like to like People like we've been just talking about Orianthe or Paul Gilbert or somebody like that, them giving feedback would be like super incredible, awesome. But really, right. it doesn't have to be like this famous name thing. It just has to be somebody who's been playing for a long time and had the site. And I know, you know, yeah, I know a lot of local teachers that are just great players, and that would be cool. And yeah, I suppose in the closed group, or, or something like that, I would give more like feedback that might help improve it, you know, like a, like a compliment sandwich would be like, hey, I love that part at this section. That was amazing. Maybe you want to try to add more dynamics or something or like slow it down or leave some space. Yep. But awesome job and your tone sounds great. You know, like, whereas on Twitter, I just say all the positive reinforcement, like, oh, I like how you slowed down there or I like how you did this. Yep. But there's always in the back of my head as a teacher, like, you, I think maybe they could work on this or they could work on that. You know what I mean? Exactly right. And that's kind of what I was talking about, like where it's authentic feedback and positive. You know, like in my mind, I can think of one of the solos that I did for one of those improv jams. And I ran out of like things to say at a moment. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) and then I kind of went, and I was doing tremolo and I was thinking, what do I do next? (laughs) And then I thought of it. Nobody said, dude, what happened 
at that moment when you just kind of stop for a second. You know? Right, right. No. People said, okay, at like 30 seconds later, you did this thing, which was really cool. You know, like I, yep. I would in incorporate that in my playing or how did you do that? Yeah, it's like in this group, lift other people up. So they were trying to lift you up and say, I like what you did here. And there's someone that's just trying to lift themselves up. They'd be like, hey, what happened there? You know, yeah. Space yeah. Or something. They didn't like focus on that. I love that. I mean, I love just the exercise of it, actually, like to actually participating because it meant that a couple times a week, I was like forcing myself to practice. I, you know, as a music teacher, I play lots of instruments every day. In fact, you know, like, oh, yeah, I bet. But actually sitting down and focusing on pushing my playing as a guitarist forward. Yeah. Yeah. I know that feeling. And there's like with improvising, I, I, I feel like well, it was my favorite thing to do. That's the thing I love to do on the guitar. And, and like, because it's almost like meditating, right? You can't, you're in the moment. Like, you can't think of anything else. Like, did, oh, did I pay my bills or uh, well, I get this thing later? As soon as you think, you're gone. You know what I mean? So you really have to focus. That's probably what I'm <laughs> there. And I was doing the, <laughs> just bending yeah. it up. Did I, did I like, turn off the stove? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I would have to like figure something out, like oh, I want to do this song. All right, and I'd have to tap it out real quick, and then learn how to play it, and show how to play it. And if I start playing it wrong, then they're learning it wrong. So I'd have to be like, ah. Oh. So yeah. I felt that pressure. But like as soon as I, I stopped doing that, I was like, all I'm doing is playing for other people. I want to learn, you know, start playing for myself. So when I got away from teaching, that sort of situation, I was, I started just playing for myself, especially when COVID hit. And like I got my guitar like right here, like next to my desk and just like doo -doo, like in meetings and whatnot. I haven't played this much in my whole life. I love it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate that just for the improv jams. I mean, for me as well, that came during what here in China was still a lockdown time. And it was so good to have rather than just me playing, I don't know, Leonard Skinner again, <laughs> <laughs> no, which nothing wrong with Leonard Skinner. I mean, just I, yeah. I play I've played it a billion times, you know, um, right. and suddenly you were putting stuff on there that I was like, oh, actually, I've never tried to play that one. Hmm. And then right. it, sort of, it sort of helps me to put my mind in a different place. I do that with bands all the time. Like every time I'm in some sort of cover band, I never suggest the songs. Actually, I always just say to the band members, give us two songs each and we'll pick which ones like seem like they would be fun to jam and people might enjoy them. Yeah. And then I've ended up playing stuff that I never would have imagined playing th through doing that. Cause like the drummer will pick, like, I remember one drummer had picked uh, earth, wind and fire, uh, September. Oh, nice. It's a great okay, yeah. It is. It was just like, he loved the groove of the drums. That's why he picked it. And I was like, yeah. oh, I've never actually played it, you know? And it, so it, it's not something you'd sit down and be like, today I'm going to learn September. Like, yeah. Like you want to learn a guitaristic song, but yeah, I know what you mean. Exactly. And so, you know, and I've done a bunch of like Michael Jackson stuff that I was like, hmm, I hadn't thought of that. That's cool. No, a lot of times it's just like, I don't know. It's just uh, making me think in a way that I wouldn't have been thinking just on my own, you know? So Neil, we've been talking a lot about the PW improv jam, which happens on Twitter. One thing about Twitter, it has no memory. So what I've been doing is going back to the new site and the lessons, I made a whole section where it's almost set up like a course, but each lesson just has that thread embedded all the way from the first PW wow. Improv Jam to like this week, 36 weeks into it now. Jeez. So that way, what I do is I just take the Twitter thread or whatever, and I just embed it into that course. Oh, so okay. you can go like, okay, on week five, what was the tune? And you go there, there's the tune. There's everybody's submission. There's all the different like comments and, you know, likes and retweets. And so it's all right there. Yeah, that's a great solution, actually. On the chat format, it's like bite-sized chunks. It's one or two minutes, whatever it is, of somebody yeah. playing. That's easy to watch. And I don't miss a second of it. And then I find those moments like with that. Is his name Gene? I know there's one. Gene, yeah, yeah. Oh, Gene. Jane? Jean? There's 
Jane, J-A-N-N-E, and then Gene, G-E-E-N. We're talking about it, but I really think for people to see what we're talking about, like take one of the songs that you posted yeah. and show like two or three different versions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes, like what people do, like suddenly there's one who plays like a clean sound with no distortion, and then another guy plays yeah. like just shredding with distortion right. and everything, and then another guy does like an Alex Lifeson sort of harmonics and slow notes type of thing. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm wow. the same jam. it's mind-blowing is there one backing track that you remember you were like the variance in takes on it was was the biggest oh i i wish i i could pull one out of my hat but yeah i don't i can't remember but like yeah like like gene and jane like those two players in particular Jane is so he he shreds he's got sweeps and he's he's studying these courses straight out of finland or something and he had you know very fusiony sort of vibe going on with him whereas gene he has this great sense of melody almost david gilmore-ish like there's no real shredding and that's not to say that's a bad thing every time he plays i'm like oh my god i wish i had his melodic sense where he can just find he finds these like melody lines over these chords i didn't know they were there you know what i mean so there's two different takes and then yeah and there's, there's someone the like tom who's clean tom dust who's clean but he has kind of that melodic sort of sense too or mikey who's like shredding it up and well i was just, thinking i was that's what i was going to jump in with mikey yeah as soon as he started playing i was like whoa like this guy i don't know i think he's got a really good melodic sense as well he can shred but he's not just oh yeah like noodling over like i i played I, remember, I always remember this one guy who i played with who was just like incredible he was he was ingve malmstein type you oh know? yeah <laughs> but yeah he had no sense of the song like mm. we could be playing anything imagine by john lennon he'd go imagine all the people <laughs> dude relax. like no dude <laughs> <laughs> like hear the song and Mikey is not like right. that at all. Like he's got the ability to shred, but he hears the song, you know? Yeah. And he responds to it. It's like, so I'm hearing <laughs> stuff like that on these jams and it just keeps getting better. So I really want to include some of that in what we're talking about so that people watching yeah. who haven't seen it yet will understand what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I hope they see it and want to add their own voice to it and join in, you know? And yeah, it's totally supportive. There's plays I, of all different levels, and and I, I love that, you know? Yeah, like, I, that's that's another thing, actually, that I love about this is, like, I've, I've invited people to come and jam with me before, you know? And mm -hmm. especially if it's people who work in the school where I work, they're like, oh, no, you're the music teacher, and you know this, and you blah, blah. And they're like... I don't think like that. You know, I just want people to right. play, you know, right. And with this jam thing, exactly what you said, like there have been people who have put in stuff that they're just like, I really didn't know what to do with this, but I'm putting it here because they know it'll be a community that'll be like supportive. And here are like the highlights of what you did, you know? Yeah. We're just like trying to pick up, okay, here's something you did that you should probably keep doing. 
you know, like that. Yeah. It makes me think of um, Chef on Two Wheels. Uh, I think he's from out of Spain, self-proclaimed beginner. He just, he just, he's doing the right thing. He just keeps showing up. And he just keeps doing it. And every time you can see him getting better and better. Yeah, and that would be cool. And people are saying, oh, I like how you did this. I like how you did that. And I feel like he picks up on that. And then next week you see more of that and new stuff. And So you're 36 weeks in. It'd be cool, like, at your... I don't know, 100th anniversary or something to have like a retrospective. I don't know how hard this would be to do. So I'm just going to throw it out there. But like <laughs> someone like that and say, listen, this is week one of this person participating. And this is week yeah. X number of that same person. Because that's one of the things I've been loving as well. You can see drastic differences in what some of these players are now playing because of this one thing. Yeah. Yeah. And in my own playing, I see it too. Things I've been working on is trying to leave more breathing room. Don't do like run on sentences, you know, but at the same time, like, I feel like I've I'm very getting more comfortable just switching pentatonics and I get a nice flow going, but I want to throw in like some fast licks, like guys like Cliff do or Mike, and they just like, they throw it in. It seems so natural. And you're yeah. Like, it's just like, like wow, it's so cool. And they just jump right back into like the slow, the melodic lines, and then they blast out this thing, and then they tap in and they're back in the, the stingable lines. And so yeah. that's the stuff that I'm working on. I feel like I'm getting better at it. I just keep showing up and doing it too, you know. Like uh um, Yeah. I, I watch every one of them actually. You know, I don't always get a chance to record. What I have done is I've like watched somebody doing one with a guitar in my hand. You know, yeah. so I have recorded it because I feel like when I'm recording it, it has to be at least coherent enough that people can see where I'm going with the idea. Whereas I've actually right. been wrong with some of those tracks just because I thought what they were doing was really cool and I kind of wanted to imitate it. So yeah. I'm using it as instructional without sending in the videos. But That's I awesome. Videos because the feedback I found super useful, like... You know, the moments that people picked up on, it's kind of like the analytics on, on YouTube where you can see where most people are watching kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. It felt a little like that because like people would pick up on a certain section of what I played and go, yeah, that was cool. And then two or three people will reply to that. And I'm like, okay, so there's something, a little aspect of my playing that I want to continue and maybe even develop and grow from there, yeah. you know? Yeah, so, yeah. Positive feedback. Let's do double down on that. Yes, yeah. And you know, it's it's been working. I I was looking at the numbers this morning. Do you know how many followers you have currently as the Pentatonic Way on Twitter? It's getting close, isn't it? Almost like six thousand. Yeah, five thousand seven hundred and ninety-nine today. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I think there's tons of stuff that you have done all the way through. There's always the mm -hmm. community type stuff. Yesterday was the third anniversary of the passing of Eddie Van Halen, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Unbelievable. Bring my Van Halen shirt. There you go. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I wore a different one yesterday because today's the eighth here. So it's the seventh. Yeah, so yeah. I bring my Van Halen shirts this weekend. Um, I love it. Did you ever see him live? Yes. Yeah, I saw them in Toronto. Yeah, I saw them once. The Eddie Van Halen, for me, was a huge influence. And as a guitarist, but also... When when he started playing the keyboards, like I started out myself on the piano. That was my first instrument. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I studied with the Royal Conservatory of Music for a number of years on piano. Oh, wow. Cool. And I used to my mom, I was like, I don't know, 10 years old. And my mom said, you have to practice for one hour because that's what they said you're supposed to do. And I was like, that's a really long. <laughs> so I had gotten interested in the guitar. And so my mom being my mom, super clever lady, she went out and she <laughs> bought me um, a Vantage electric guitar. It was a copy of a Les Paul. And nice. she, listen, you love the guitar. Why don't you practice the piano for 30 minutes? Then take a break. Play your guitar for, you know, as long as you want, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it is. And then go back to the piano and, and do thir another 30 minutes. So I was like, wow, my mom's like giving in. <laughs> that worked your mom was a smart lady dude it was amazing so i ended up practicing the piano for 30 minute chunks every day plus you know an increasing number of of minutes on the guitar as well because then 
I got my boss awesome. pedal and my my chorus and my wah pedal and stuff. And I was like, suddenly yes. break time because there was no structure for that. So break time I, guitar meant I could just be like doing ping ponging with my digital delay from one amp to the other. Did you ever do that? I always I only had one amp, but oh. yeah, like the stereo sort of. Yeah, yeah. So I would cool. <laughs> I would do that <laughs> until. I don't know. I got tired of it or I realized I have to go back to piano now. And that's so the reason I tell all of that was because Eddie Van Halen, when he started to play keyboards on their tracks, mm. where yeah. I thought, man, I can do both. Like people can play guitar and piano and it's OK. You don't have to always be one or the other. Right. So and that was so like controversial back then. Watch Jordan Brutus. That guy is amazing. But then he plays the guitar now and he started to do something where he, he plays both at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Jacob Collier. That dude plays everything. You know, yes. he's a phenomenal piano player, but he's also a phenomenal guitarist and bass player and singer and percussionist, like Amy. plays people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he the audience. He, he plays the audience. Yeah. Back so then it wasn't like that. You know, it was like you play this and you stay in your lane. That's and it. This is what your band is supposed to sound like, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and he was like, yeah, no, you know what? I'm hearing this. And, and that was always his guide, you know, like whatever he heard or wanted to bring into reality and he just went with it and, and it just worked just blessed you know yeah and we well, were all blessed for it incredible hard work and just the 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 strength to say i don't care if you think everybody has like i'm a guitar god so i'm not allowed to play keyboards <laughs> watch this yeah, yeah. I remember listening to uh, reading the interview in Guitar Player magazine back then. I forget what song it is, but they were like, Yeah, like on this tune, I think it was maybe Dreams or something. You only played like two notes. And it's I can think of it right now, notes and in Panama he plays a Lamborghini, so you know, he <laughs> Yeah. Whatever it takes. You yeah. Know? <laughs> that, that was I remember when I was in like high school and I was playing guitar and all of us had this little community of guys that were playing in bands and stuff. And the debate was always Ingve Malmsteen versus Eddie Van Halen because oh, <laughs> Ingve obviously shredder and stuff like that. But a lot of people said like he doesn't have that melodic sense. He just shreds. And then people said, well, then there's Eddie Van Halen who can play anything completely unique sound and he plays what the song needs. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I Again, Ingvar Malmsteen, I, I actually think he had a great sense of that as well. The songs were written in a different way. I, I feel like they were sort of written around his lead lines. But That's he, what I was just thinking. It's the, whole, the opposite. Right. Like, Ingvar's songs are written around his style and around his melody lines, more like an orchestra, you know, like they were orchestrated around his stuff. And then Eddie's, were written around Alex's drums and that groove that they could get together. And then Eddie would just play these lines over it. Like talking about cover bands, anytime we covered a Van Halen tune, I was, I was like, all right, I got to try to really, I really want to do this solo justice, you know, and really try to get it. And you realize that like, it's not all like to a metronome, you know what I mean? Like a lot of times it would just, I'm not, I don't want to say like a jumble of notes, but it would be like a, like a whole bunch and it wouldn't strictly fall into like the rhythmic grid, you know, and, but he'd land on his feet. And I remember reading an interview with him where he'd say like a lot of my solos, it's like, I'm falling down the stairs and trying to land on my feet. And I was like, that's what he's talking about. You know what I mean? With these, these things and you can see him notated, but when you see him, it's like, you know, triplets and quarter notes and groups of five and you're like all at once. And then he lands on a thing. And then there's like, you know, the tapping and then he does another, it's just like, it was just so cool, man. It just went for it, you know? And they, his dad was a jazz clarinetist, if I remember. And you yep. hear a lot of that swing in there. sort of 
outside notes, but he makes them work, you know, because of it just gives it a swagger, sort of a, you know, a naughtiness that, <laughs> you know, totally. only Eddie could bring to it. Yeah. I mean, so a couple of things from what you just said, like suddenly this has become a podcast about Eddie Van Halen. Hey. Hey. Okay, what are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> so, um, Leon and I, in one of our earlier episodes, talked about this because we were talking about Johann Sebastian Bach. Leon is a pretty strictly piano keyboard guy. And he said, if you analyze Eddie Van Halen's playing from a keyboardist's point of view, it makes a lot more sense. Oh, yeah. His style, even the hammer-ons, it's very Baroque, actually. Huh. It's, if you think of what Johann Sebastian Bach did, the well-tempered clavier... And then you transpose Eddie Van Halen's playing on top of that. Suddenly, it's like, oh, actually, that makes a lot of sense. It's from a guitarist's perspective, if you're thinking blues or stuff like that, what he played was right. like, completely out of the box right but if you think of it in terms of like baroque playing it actually makes yeah. a lot of sense i think i know what you mean like where you know it's very like triad and arpeggio based but at yeah. the same time i feel like randy Rhodes was a lot like that but his was much stiffer sounding you know what i mean where and that was the debate we always had eddie or randy Rhodes, and where eddie was more swinging and loose and just from the hip randy was very constructed and composed Just as cool. You know, and, but I think they talking about that sort of classical approach rather than the blues. And then I think Nuno took that to the next level and he started doing the string skipping. And the... is all arpeggio based too like, and it's it's not just like off the cuff like he worked it out you know oh. like and they'll and he'll compose almost like brian may he'll compose the the chord progressions underneath to support that you know so yeah pretty cool eddie van halen van halen i saw um an interview with him once um where somebody asked him which guitar solo he was most proud of which i expected mm -hmm say how could i say like you know how could i name the one but he did yeah he jump jump yeah said the guitar solo and um i believe the reason for that was if you've have you ever played jump live i haven't no i've never had a keyboard player do oh okay so <laughs> i i found i have played that and I found that the guitar solo itself wasn't really hard to play, actually. What was hard was to get the whole band to play the solo section. Ah. Like, this playing in that part is crazy. It is, it's awesome, you I, know? I can think of it right now. <laughs> like those different hits. Yeah, and, and just the whole thing, like people talk about Michael Anthony as, you know, well, he's pretty good, but he's not this and that. Listen to that section. Listen to that section. Yeah. Yeah. Guy has a sense of rhythm. Oh, and yeah. So 
there was one band that I was in and we decided to do jump. We were doing like an eighties night thing, you know? Oh, cool. I'll put on our long hair wigs and <laughs> <laughs> I was an eighties cover band. I can tell you about that. after. There you go. Yeah, so, we wigs. Um, so we did jump. And then when it came to the solo section, eventually we had decided to cut it at that part and do a, a medley. It ironically with a uh, crazy train. So oh, cool. At the part of the solo, instead of going dun, 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 the, the the Alex Van Halen thing, we broke into the beginning of Crazy Train and then did that. Nice. A, and people said, I remember a friend of mine came up and he said, yeah, you kind of chickened out at the guitar solo there, eh? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it wasn't me, like, it was the band. Play, I, I, was, I was laughing because um, I, I could play the solo. But the amount of time that our whole band would have had to put in to learning that section... Yeah, just time to do it. Like we had, you know, two weeks to prep for this show, and you oh, know, yeah. resets. You know, so we're talking. Yeah, you like, gotta prioritize. Yeah, so it was like, guys, we can spend the next three practices trying to get this right, and we might nail it. You know, <laughs> or yeah, dun, 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 and yeah. you know, the audience, eighty percent of them are gonna be like, yeah. Yeah, another 80s song that's awesome. The guitarists are going like, what happened? I thought he was going to go into the guitar Yeah, song. like everybody's, you know, like the guitar Dude. players. Everybody's in yeah. the audience just like loving the fact that we're playing Van Halen and then Ozzy Osbourne and Randy Rhodes, you know? Yeah, yeah. But then <laughs> players are like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, and- here it comes. <laughs> oh, <What? duh>. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think, I think that's why Eddie Van Halen counted Jump as like his proudest guitar solo moment because it was just such a well-constructed part of a song right well now i have to ask what is your eddie van halen solo Ooh, that's interesting <laughs> i think uh, i know mine really wow i think so it's always been but i like uh i love ice cream man love really love yeah so cool it's like it's almost that chuck berry style and then he goes into brings this crazy eddie van halen stuff into it and he's got the phase on it the whole time as well which just like you know he's got that that effect on it that sort of brought it to to that moment in time as well which was yeah yeah yeah, updated it yes exactly you know that song i i had read somewhere that ice cream man was a david lee roth song that he used to do with piano like a boogie oh really Ding, 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 ding. You can hear that now after you've done all this solo stuff. Like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Well, now, yeah. summertime ship, babe, need something to keep you cool. All right. Summertime ship, babe, need something to keep you cool. You better look out now. I got something for you. Tell you what. So, but he used to do that like in his in his own shows, I think before even Mammoth, before like he joined, oh, wow. like before they changed their name to Van Halen. Yeah. Um, And then he brought it to the band. And of course, Eddie Van Halen took it and said, OK, let's do this with it. <laughs> and yeah, and I, so that's a, that's a really interesting choice. I, I don't know. I'll have to think on that one in my mind right now. I'm just thinking jump. That's a great choice. I remember I was obsessed with the Panama solo, especially this one lick right near the beginning. I just I could never get it. And I mean, back when I was learning it, I had a, a cassette tape, right? And a, a recorder that didn't have rewind. So you had to put it in, you play it, and you go, oh, I was that. Oh, damn it, you have to stop it and take it out, fast forward, flip it over, play it. <laughs> You're like, wait, 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 damn it, what is that? Did you keep missing it every time? Yeah. Now I know it, and it turned out to be a pentatonic thing. So I, that's the thing that drew me to it as well. Like every time I'd, 
I'd go research one of those licks, any, any lick that was like, oh, I love how that sounds. Or like, it was always pentatonic. And I was like, not so simple. Like, I thought it would have been something cool, like harmonic minor, melodic minor, yeah. Lydian flat sharp four, you know, Lydian flat seven, you know, altered, you know, pentatonic, super simple. I'd, I'd dissect Dimebag Daryl's licks and be like, oh, I love that. Nope, just a pentatonic. All right, cool. <laughs> it's well, like you, something about it. That's the thing. You know, it's it's amazing that you found this and you're not, you know, like the only person who's who's saying this. So clearly there's oh, yeah. a, it just makes sense. And it's not about it being really difficult gymnastics for your fingers. It's about sounding great in the song. And yeah. so Steve Vai. I remember the guitarist who said Eddie Van Halen was the guy who made you pick up the guitar. Steve Vai was the one who made you put it back down again. <laughs> 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 yeah, I could see that. <laughs> like, I mean, have you seen the? I can't remember the name of the the new guitar that he's um, helped. Oh, the Hydra. Play. Yeah. The Hydra. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. I was like, that is just ugly. And what is he thinking? And then I saw him play it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And I was like, okay. Oh, yeah. Take Steve Vai to make that thing make sense. <laughs> It's so Steve Vai, though. I remember his heart guitar with all the necks on it. He's always had wacky things, but then, he'll, you know, it's not, it starts out his form, but then it he turns it into function, like you're saying, you know, like he gives it a purpose, which yeah. is cool. Yeah, that guy's uh, amazing in terms of creativity. I was thinking the other day about one of his solos from the David Lee Roth era. It was Hot Dog and a Shake. I don't know if you remember that, but there's a section that I, I used to be obsessed with, and he's like, shredding right and then on this take he stops you're just like oh this isn't happening but he starts up again and it's awesome to hear it what is that you know like and then i read the interviews about it but i was like who does that they just totally stop and then bring it back in and just continues with this amazing solo. And, just... and what what's so Steve Vai about that is the fact that he left it in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like that was everybody so cool. everybody does that in a recording session where you go, blah, blah, blah. oh, that didn't. And then you like erase it and start again, you know. But his Zappa yeah. days, probably he just said, no, like sometimes the crazy mistake turns out to be the best thing that could have happened. Yeah. It's like Bob Ross and his happy little accidents. You know what I mean? It's, you just thank whoever for it, whoever you pray to. Thank you for that, that that happened, you know, like, and, and you got to recognize it too, though, and slow down and be open to it and not that be like, thing. okay, we got to make this perfect. Happy perfect accidents like happen all the time. It's just whether or not you're um, willing to notice it or able to notice it and willing to use it, you know? Yeah. I remember reading about Tobacco Road on that same album that Ooh, ends yeah. when he says, David Lee Ross is Tobacco Road. Yeah. Steve Vai was saying in an interview, his he did the whammy bar and the you know how the top string will wobble a little bit. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like it says tobacco or something like and okay. he recognized and said, Oh, cool. No, leave that in, you know, like we, we're not gonna get anything better than that. And it's just one of those things, you know, like another one of those happy accidents. I was lucky enough to play that song live with a band a while ago, a few years ago. Nice. Uh, our bass player liked the original version of it. Um, and he hadn't heard the David Lee Roth version with Steve Vai. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, man, you got to hear. <laughs> I, I think that was one of those covers that turns out to be better than the original because. Yeah. And it kind I'm of. Not, like, I don't know if I've heard the original. Oh, you got. You should hear it in terms of. In those terms. Like, because yeah. what Steve Vai did with that riff, down, 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 he made it really yeah. grooving, right? The original one. Yeah was much less sort of smooth. I want to mention we're talking about songwriting and stuff, and I found some of your music on um, SoundCloud, I believe it was. Or okay, Morning Light. Oh yeah. Oh my. Got... 
I I really like that. Like it's so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. The keyboard part comes in and I'm like, wow. Oh well, so that project was called Sound Art, and that was during the, the quarantine. And what my idea was was to take royalty-free hip-hop tracks or dance tracks that mm-hmm. I found online and take them just as they are and then add in one guitar part and make it a whole song. You know what I mean? Almost Satriani ish where I have a melody. It's not just me shredding. It's like, all right, now it's a song. And that was the first one I found, and that composer is amazing, and I've talked with him. Oh, really? But yeah, yeah. He writes for cartoons now and stuff, and he wrote this song called Judo that I love. The other song that I found is The Blessing. Oh, thank you, yeah. There was like seven or eight tunes on there. And that one was more mellow, you know, but it had that sort of a cool groove to it. And uh, that sort of, what is Rick Beato calls it, cicada hi-hats, where it's like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but it was cool. And I was like, I think I can do something with this, you know? I like the video because it, it really uh, gave the same feeling of your playing. I like what you did with the whammy bar, actually. There are a couple really cool moments where you just do really subtle little bend things. It sounded like the way, just you bending the note. I'm not sure. It might have been. I feel like it was on my Michael Kelly, which it doesn't have a whammy. I actually haven't had a whammy bar in like a decade, and I really miss it. I wow. used to, I used to use it all the time, but that was like, I was like, I think I should learn how to play a little bit more. <laughs> I was like a crutch almost. Yes, yeah. But now I feel like if I got back to it, I could really have a lot of fun with it. You know and keep it musical or whatever you know yeah. i was just dive bombing every second <laughs> like just, buddy, like, all the wing bay stuff i'd be like imagine there's no heaven <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, you're fired. i have all of the um it's become a thing for me I, you know that back plate on the back of the fender strat i take it off yeah star because right for, to to string it you have to string it through the back there which right is one of the, the only things i don't like about the fender strat and the way that you have to string right. it. um but with the plate on it it's like an extra layer of difficulty so i just take the plate off line up. i don't think you're alone with that i know john mayer does that and on his prs he just doesn't even there's no back plate he doesn't even let you take it off it's just not on there oh <laughs> well, you know, a silver sky, whatever. It is, yeah, mine, mine, mine aren't custom made, so I have to take them off with the little, the little. Yeah, screws, you know, me too. <laughs> but the first time I did that was because I was bending so much with the whammy bar that the spring stretched, and so I had I had oh, to man. tighten the screw to pull the string, the spring. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's hardcore, man. Yeah, well, you know, at the time, and it was exactly what you were saying. I, I didn't played that well so when i needed to and i couldn't think of anything i just did a dive bomb like harmonic yeah it's a go-to minute but i played in a band clayton brown was this guitar player in toronto and he did some crazy stuff with the whammy bar he used to hang his guitar on the whammy bar just go oh yeah yeah i've seen that i've tried that yeah i haven't tried that i was too scared but um but he also showed me a lot of really subtle little bends, like where he would just sort of tap it in the middle. So yeah. he kept his whammy bar handle really tight so it didn't fall when he let go. Okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it was a of a solo. Yeah. He like do a, like he'd hit it so it would kind oh. of like purr. Yeah. I seeing, yeah. John Petrucci, that was the first guy I noticed that did that. Or Vi did it. They'd have yeah. it back here though. Like, yeah. yes yeah yeah flutter do this stuff like instead of his finger bending the nose he was doing a backwards bend it's like yeah, like a release bend like correct yeah, yeah. do that with his webby bar so it was really seamless 
And yeah. that realized, oh, it wasn't actually put on there for you to break the guitar. It was actually like <laughs> surprise. <laughs> what a... <laughs> Who knew? Seventeen year old, yeah. like really? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> anyway, so Neil, thanks again for uh, for coming on and chatting with me. I. I'm not even sure what I'm what I'm gonna call this uh, this episode because it's kind of like guitar, you know. <laughs> Everything, yeah. Oh, I, mean, I appreciate you having me on. And I love uh, love just chatting with you and chatting about guitars. And, you know, thanks so much again. This is a Thank pleasure. You, you know, I, I I just said I'm gonna end this off, but then I remember because I said something because you used to have the global or you still have the global guitar network. But yeah, yeah. I wrote my books around that. Well, that, that's where there was one point not that long ago that I wrote a blog post about guitar picks. <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, right. I think a lot of people would be like, uh, you wrote a post about picks? <laughs> but you right. weren't that. You, you said, here are two links for things that I've written about picks. And it was from the Global Guitar Network. And you could yeah. that blog. So I really appreciated that. And then I posted it on Twitter and a bunch of people from the Pentatonic Way community also contributed this is the pick that i use and this is why i use this and stuff so um i just think this whole idea of a guitar uh community that you're building is super cool and i'm so happy that i, I count myself as one of the people who i feel like i'm part of that community and i, I appreciate it absolutely that. absolutely oh thank you and I, I just hope it keeps growing and growing uh, yeah i can't imagine why it wouldn't i think you're doing great stuff and um, for anybody who's seen this here, I'm going to have the links for all of the stuff that we've mentioned in the description. Awesome. Um, so hopefully people will uh, will go check it out because it's well worth watching. Oh, I thank you so much for spreading the word. All right. Oh, yeah. Thanks again, Neil. I appreciate it. Well, I know I'll be seeing you on Twitter and I hope we'll chat again. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be there. That's for sure. Cool. All right. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks again. Talk to you soon. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Good night.